Happy Sunday, Good News Church. All right, so we are continuing our series called Titles of the Christ. We are now at part five of Titles of the Christ, and we told you at the beginning that we wanted to cover seven different titles of Jesus Christ, titles like prophet, titles like king, and the, uh, the goal has been that as we learn these titles that Jesus Christ has, or as we learn these roles that Jesus fulfills, we understand him better. Each sermon, each week is supposed to help us see Christ like from a different angle, um, and so far, we've covered uh, prophet, priest, king, God, and then today is sacrifice, and then the plan for the final two would be judge and savior. Um, my hope is that by hearing about Jesus in seven different ways, you'll end up with a, a fuller understanding of him. Um, but here's an issue with this. Our goal for this series has, really, has not been for us to preach perfectly balanced sermons, Okay? The goal really has been for, by the time we're done, that we will have preached a, a balanced series. Does that make sense? Because we're learning different things at, all at once. And so I could imagine um, some, it would be possible for someone to hear one of the sermons in this series and then say, like, well, I feel like you left something out. Okay? Well, yes, we left six things out. Like Every week we taught one thing and left six things out that we got to on the other weeks. So if there are any of you here who by the end of this series, you look back and you go, okay, I attended weeks two, five, and seven, um, I would encourage you to go back to our church website and catch up on the ones you missed so that you get the full picture. Okay, so today's topic is sacrifice, okay? Christ is our sacrifice. One thing that I hope that you will notice um, that has already happened throughout this series and something that you'll just notice in the Bible itself is that Jesus in the New Testament is often portrayed as something that he's often portrayed as like a bigger, better, more ultimate version of something that was in the Old Testament. Have you noticed that? Jesus is the true and better and ultimate version of something that was talked about in the Old Testament. That's certainly true of like prophet, priest, and king. In the Old Testament, there were kings, right? But then Jesus is not just one of many kings, right? He's the king of kings. In the Old Testament, there were priests. Jesus is the ultimate high priest, better than those high priests that died and just, you know, died. Um, he's, in the Old Testament, there were prophets. Okay, Jesus is the prophet. And so all of that, like Jesus is the fuller version, the more ultimate, better version of whatever this thing is, that will be true of this morning's topic as well, sacrifice. We're going to see that Jesus is the ultimate, better version of the sacrifices that we see in the Old Testament. And so let's go ahead and begin this morning there. Before we get to the passages of the Bible that are actually about Jesus, let's go back into the Old Testament and look at what the Old Testament said about sacrifices so we understand what, who Jesus is. So if you have your Bible, um, we're going to go to Leviticus chapter 5, okay? People hardly ever go to Leviticus, okay? We're going to look at a few passages in Leviticus in order to understand the sacrificial system. So we'll start with Leviticus chapter 5. I'm going to read to you the first six verses of Levit Leviticus chapter 5. Here's the first, starting at the beginning. When someone sins in any of these ways, and then there's a list of sins. If he has seen, heard, or known about something he has witnessed and did not respond to a public call to testify, he is responsible for his sin. Or if someone touches anything unclean, a carcass of an unclean wild animal or unclean livestock or unclean swarming creature, without being aware of it, he is unclean and guilty. Or if he touches human uncleanness, any uncleanness by which one can become defiled, without being aware of it, but later recognizes it, he is guilty. Or if someone swears rashly to do what is good or evil, concerning anything a person may speak rashly in an oath, without being aware of it, but later recognizes it, he incurs guilt in such an instance. Okay, now after listing that, now look at this next verse. If someone incurs guilt in one of these cases, he is to confess he has committed that sin. He must bring his restitution for the sin he has committed to the Lord. A female lamb or goat from the flock as a sin offering. In this way, the priest will make atonement on his behalf for his sin. So we can see in the Old Testament, there would be people who would sin against God. Most of those sins in that list were actually not ways that people sin against other humans, but typically most of, or most of those things in there were ways that these people were sin, would sin against God. And so people would sin against God, and then a sin offering was made, a sacrifice was made, a lamb was killed. Now, if you turn over one page, you'll see another description of this. It's a little bit different, though. These, the restitution offerings are talked about in Leviticus chapter 6. 
There's some similarities and some differences. Let me read it to you. Leviticus 6, starting in verse 1. The Lord spoke to Moses. When someone sins and offends the Lord by... Now, here we have another list of sins coming. By deceiving his neighbor in regard to a deposit, a security, or a robbery, or defrauds his neighbor, or finds something lost and lies about it, or swears falsely about any of the sinful things a person may do. Once he has sinned and acknowledged his guilt, he must return what he stole or defrauded, or the deposit entrusted to him, or the lost item he found, or anything else about which he swore falsely. He must make full restitution for it and add a fifth of its value to it. He is to pay to it to its owner on the day he acknowledges his guilt. So you can see someone who sinned against someone and, and wronged them financially, would, were supposed, they were supposed to pay them back and not just pay them back, pay them back and add 20%. Do you see that? And I think the whole purpose of that was so that it would be a deterrent. If the, if the, the consequence of stealing something was just giving it back... Well, everybody would try to steal something because what do you have to lose? Like worst case scenario, you got to give it back and you're back to where you were. But in this case, it was no, no, don't just steal things because if you steal it, you got to give it back plus 20%. So these people were told to make this restitution. But then notice this. So he's supposed to pay to his owner on the day he acknowledges his guilt. Verse six, then, so process is not over yet. Then he must bring his restitution offering to the Lord an unblemished ram from the flock according to your assessment of its value as a restitution offering to the priest. In this way, the priest will make atonement on his behalf before the Lord. So I want you to notice, the, the, someone sins against someone else. And in the Old Testament, it wasn't just, okay, I sinned against this person, so I, now I need to make it right to them. I make restitution, add 20%, and now I'm done. No, once you've made things right with them, you still have to acknowledge that you sinned against God. So now there has to be a restitution made to God. So the unblemished lamb is brought as a restitution offering to the priest. Verse 7, in this way... The priest will make atonement on his behalf before the Lord, and he will be, what's the word? Forgiven. Forgiven for anything he may have done to incur guilt. So I picked this passage because it shows that sins against other people are also sins against God. Like sometimes we think, well, I didn't sin against God, I just sinned against her, right? It was considered any sin that was where you robbed someone or you lied to them or you did whatever, that was, considering, that was something that offended the Lord. So you would make it right with them and with God. Okay, so they were sinning against others and they were sinning against God. And the other reason I picked this passage is specifically because of the word forgiven. This is the, this is the passage of the ones that I picked this morning um, that specifies the word forgiven. I think sometimes we can read this and go, the priest will make atonement. Well, what does that mean to make atonement? And so in this verse, it seems really clear. What does it mean to make atonement on his behalf before the Lord? He will be forgiven of anything that he may have done to incur guilt. The last passage I want to read to you is in Leviticus chapter 16, um, at least out of these passages in Leviticus. Um, it's Leviticus 16. Uh, the whole chapter, Leviticus 16, is about the Day of Atonement. This was a once-a-year a, once a day where the peoples of sins, the people of Israel, their sins would be dealt with. I'm not going to read the whole chapter to you. It's 34 verses long. I'm just going to read some excerpts so you get the feel of the kind of thing that was done once a year when they were dealing with the nation's sins. So look at Leviticus 16, starting in verse 3. Aaron is to enter the most holy place in this way. Who in the world is Aaron? Anybody know? Yeah, he was the high priest. At the time, he was the high priest. Eventually, there were later on different high priests who were, had other names other than Aaron. But at this point, the high priest's name was Aaron. Aaron is to enter the most holy place. That's important. Let's go ahead and say that together on the count of three. One, two, three. Most holy place. Okay? I just want you to get that in your mind. Some of you, why, why do I got to repeat after the preacher? Well, you don't have to. No one's going to force you to do it. But the reason why I sometimes do that is because we're going to come up to some passages later on where we're going to find the words, the most holy place. And I wanted you to remember this moment. Okay? Aaron is to enter the most holy place. That would be a room in the tabernacle where this restitution offering, where this sin offering was made. Aaron is to enter the most holy place in this way with a young bull for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. Skipping to verse 5. He is to take from the Israelite community two male goats for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. Aaron will present the bull for his sin offering and make atonement for himself and his household. I want you to notice this. It looks to me what's going on here is the high priest is also a sinner. So he is going to go to God to get forgiveness from God for the people. But before he does that, he has to get forgiveness from God for himself. Like he makes atonement for his sins and his household sins before he even addresses the sins of the country. So Aaron will present a bull for his sin offering. So verse 11. 
When Aaron presents the bull for his sin offering and makes atonement for himself and his household, he will slaughter the bull for his sin offering. Then he must take a fire pan full of fiery coals from the altar before the Lord and two handfuls of finely ground fragrant incense and bring them inside the veil. He is to put the incense on the fire before the Lord so that the cloud of incense covers the mercy seat that is over the testimony or else he will die. He is to take some of the bull's blood and sprinkle it with his finger against the east side of the mercy seat. Then he will sprinkle some of the blood with his finger before the mercy seat seven times. When he slaughters the male goat for the people's sin offering. Now remember earlier there were two goats, right? Do you remember there were two goats? So this is one of those goats. And when he slaughters the male goat for the people's sin offering and brings its blood inside the veil, he must do the same with its blood as he did with the bull's blood. He is to sprinkle it against the mercy seat and in front of it. Why in the world are they doing all this? Here's why. Look, he will purify the most holy place in this way for all their sins because of the Israelites' impurities and rebellious acts. He will do the same for the tent of meeting that remains among them because it is surrounded by their impurities. Skipping on to verse 20. When he has finished purifying the most holy place, the tent of meeting and the altar, he is to present the live male goat. Remember I said there were two. One's already dead. Now here's one that's still alive. He is to present the live male goat. Aaron will lay both his hands on the head of the live goat <clears throat> and confess over it all <clears throat> the Israelites' wrongdoings and rebellious acts, all their sins. He is to put them on the goat's head and send it away into the wilderness by the man appointed for the task. The goat will carry on it all their wrongdoings into a desolate land, and he will release it there. And then skipping to the very last verse of the chapter. This is to be a permanent statute for you to make atonement for the Israelites once a year because of all their sins. And all this was done as the Lord commanded Moses. Now, there's a lot in there, and I'm not going to go through and explain every single thing that happened on that day. But what I want you to see, and the reason why I read you enough of it to do this, is I want you to see there was a process for dealing with the people's wrongdoings. And I want you to notice in each instance, Leviticus 5, Leviticus 6, Leviticus 16, in each instance, forgiveness was available, but at a cost. Do you notice that? Every time at a cost, a sacrifice was required. So understanding that, now let's move to the New Testament. Now let's look at some Bible verses that are about Jesus Christ. We're going to go to John chapter 1. And the John that's in this particular verse is John the Baptist. John the Baptist in chapter 1, verse 28 is baptizing. And then this is the next verse with John the Baptist in it. John chapter 1, verse 29. The next day, John, that's the one that was baptizing in the verse before. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, why in the world would he call Jesus a lamb, right? Jesus was clearly a human being, right? Jesus was a human being, walked by, and he called him a lamb. And how in the world could a lamb take away sin? Well, I would say if none of us in this room were familiar with anything in the book of Leviticus, we would have no clue. We would go, that is, it's weird that he called Jesus a, an animal. It's weird that he said that, the, that he's the animal that takes away sin. It wouldn't make any sense to us. But because we just read from the book of Leviticus, we can read a verse like this and we can go, why in the world? Oh, oh, I get it. Now, in that culture, when John was speaking, okay, in ancient Israel, they would have been far more familiar with Leviticus than we are. They would have seen these sacrifices over and over and over again growing up. So they just skipped the O, oh, okay? They didn't even, when, it, when, when he said, here's the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, they didn't even bother with, oh, oh, like they just went straight to that and immediately understood what was being said, right? I think that they would have very quickly been able to figure out the Lamb that takes away sin is a reference to a sacrifice. One more passage, Hebrews chapter 9. This is the one that talks about Jesus and specifically compares him to what was talked about in Leviticus in the Day of Atonement. So Hebrews chapter 9, starting in verse 11. It says, but the Messiah has appeared. Now, who's the Messiah? Jesus. That's another title for the Christ. In fact, Messiah and Christ are synonyms, okay? So now the Christ, or the Messiah, has appeared. High priest of the good things that have come. We've already talked about him as priest, so I'm going to skip that part. In the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is not of this creation. Now, this is important to understand. In the Old Testament, the high priest, Aaron, would go into the most holy place 
inside the tabernacle. It was a place that was made by hands. It was a place that was of this creation. It was there in the middle of the desert. And he would walk in and he would make the, uh, the atoning sacrifice for the people's sins, right? And he would sp- do the blood and all the stuff that I read to you. Now notice this one says, Christ has appeared and he has come into the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands that is not of this creation. What is that referring to? Well, almost heaven for sure. Like it has to be heaven that he's talking about there. So he's saying just like Aaron would go into the holy place, which is where like the presence of God was, so it's like to meet with God in order to get forgiveness from God for the people, Jesus went to the greater most holy place, heaven, and entered in to make atonement for the people in order to offer himself for the people. So it says here, he entered, right, went to heaven, he entered the, the most holy place, which is why we said most holy place earlier, right? He's, he's entering, so there's, there's the one that was on earth, and then there's the, there's the one that's like the bigger, better version, and then bigger, better sacrifice goes into bigger, better version of the holy place. He entered the most holy place, now notice this, once for all, not once a year, like the high priests had to do, just one time ever, Jesus entered into the most holy place once for all, not by the blood of goats and calves. Why would it say that? You've got to remember, they would go, well, because that's how everybody entered into the holy place in order to make atonement and make things right between God and the people. They brought in with them the, the, the blood of the goats and the calves. Jesus entered into the holy place not by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. So this is why Jesus died on a cross. The reference to his blood is Jesus gave his life, just like the lamb, just like the ram, just like the calf that was sacrificed. Jesus died on the cross as a sacrifice. We said back in the Old Testament, forgiveness was available, but at a cost. That's true in the New Testament too. Forgiveness is available, but at a cost. And and this is the cost. Jesus, Jesus is the payment that's made for forgiveness. Now, I could imagine at this point someone might go, okay, okay, I get all that. But why? Why did Jesus have to die? Why this whole system? The whole thing seems like a bloody mess. It's all weird. You got animals and then you got a human sacrifice. Why did Jesus have to die? Couldn't Jesus, couldn't God have set up a different way of getting forgiveness? Couldn't he have done it without like killing and bloodshed and all that? Couldn't God have just overlooked sin. I have definitely been asked this before. I'm almost certain, probably multiple times. People would say things like this. Couldn't God, instead of all this stuff and Jesus dying on the cross, couldn't God have just looked at sinful humanity and just said, you're bad, you're bad, but I forgive you. Like I just, like what you did was wrong, but I just, like I I overlook it. Like no no sacrifice needed. I'm just going to pretend it didn't happen. Could God have done it that way? And I think the answer is no. Follow me here. If God is going to allow sin to exist, and he did, and if God is just, and he is, then he cannot react to sin as if it's no big deal. He can't do that. A just God cannot react to sin as if it's no big deal. So let me illustrate this. There are some things that are not sins, so they don't have to be reacted to. They don't have to be responded to as if they're a sin. So for instance, if I scratch my ear, okay, no one thinks that I have to make restitution because I just did that. No one thinks I've caused harm. No one thinks that I've offended someone or there's some sort of payment that has to be made because I did this forbidden action. No one thinks there's some sort of punishment or suffering that must be enacted on me. No, everybody realizes if Mario scratches his ear, what you have to do about it is nothing, right? Right? No response needed. You can almost just act as if it didn't happen, okay? And that'd be fine for you for the rest of your life. You can just pretend it didn't happen. But if I were to cheat on my wife, or if I were to abuse my children, or if I were to mistreat someone because of their race, or if I were to assault someone, or if I were to lie to someone, or if I were to take something that belonged to someone else and take it somewhere else and set it on fire, we realize that's different than me scratching my ear. Those things must be responded to, right? Because those are sins, something must be done about them. Whether it's anger, like I'm going to be angry at that person because they did it. Whether it's avoiding the person, like, well, now that I know they did that, I'm not going to trust them anymore. Whether it's arresting the person, whether it's making them pay for the damages. We know that we cannot treat these things like ear scratching. 
Or, or maybe a better example is like burping, because burping is a thing that people do that we would say, well, it's not wrong, and yet it's kind of considered like, you know, inappropriate in certain contexts, and there's even like a little apology that's expected. You know, somebody does it, and then you're supposed to say, excuse me, and then it's like, okay, now it's fine. But it's, <laughs> but it's not like that. So no, we, that's in a different, this thing that like, well, you do it, and then you got to say, I'm sorry, and then it's over, like that, that's different than all the other stuff I said on that list, Right? That's completely different. We cannot have, and we just know this, we cannot have a standing policy of simply ignoring evil and just pretending it didn't happen. Or even just saying, now say you're sorry, and then moving on. And everybody believes in evil. Did you know that? That is not unique to Christians. That is not just a Christian thing. Everybody believes in evil. I assume the most liberal atheist in the world believes that there are some things that are wrong. I mean, even if it's just judgmental Christians, okay? Even if they say, oh, ju- that's what's wrong with the world, hypocritical Christians, okay? And I would sit there and go, okay, well, good. At least we agree there's something wrong. We got to respond to it, right? There's bad things we got to do something about. Nobody believes that every behavior is unrelated to morality. Everyone knows that there are certain actions that must be reacted to with some kind of punishment. And then there are other actions that you don't have to do anything about at all. So in a world where evil is possible, if God is just, he cannot simply overlook lying and cheating and stealing and treat it like the scratching of the ear. I guess what what I'm saying here is this. A just God cannot treat sins like non-sins. Does that make sense? It's not righteous. It's not who he is. There must be a response. There must be a payment made. And it seems that somehow we all know that as long as when we think it through. Now, the Bible says the wages of sin is death. God gives us life. Like he gave everybody in this room life. He gives us breath as a gift. You didn't do anything to deserve it. Like you got it way long time ago before you did anything to deserve anything, right? God gives us life and breath by grace as a gift. And if we use our life to sin against him, he has the right and the duty to take that breath back. And so this is why Jesus died on the cross, because all have sinned. Everyone has sinned. Everyone has taken their life and sinned against him and now owes him their breath back. All have sinned. And so it seems a righteous God essentially has two choices. Make them pay or I will pay. Those are the only options. The let's pretend it didn't happen is not an option. Like, that's not just. Okay, so let's let's just pretend that didn't happen. That's not even on the table. Now, make them pay, that's just, but there's no mercy in that. I will pay is the only option that involves justice and mercy at the same time. So with all of that in mind, let's go to Romans chapter 3 verses 23 through 26. This is actually the big main passage I wanted you to get this morning. Romans chapter 3, starting in verse 23. I want you to see in the Bible where it teaches pretty much what I just said. Uh, For all have sinned, this is Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We just covered that. They are justified freely by his grace, right? Not by earning it. Jesus had to pay the price, not you. They are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. At least those people who are redeemed, that's how they're redeemed, by Jesus. Now look at verse 25. God presented him, the him is Jesus, as a what? As a propitiation. Now that's interesting. Okay, we're talking about the titles of the Christ. Here's a title right here. That Jesus is our propitiation. What in the world is propitiation? That is a word that is hard, I mean, it's pretty much almost never used outside of church. And it's rarely used inside a church, okay? I would imagine the vast majority of you in this room could not even give me a definition of the word propitiation, okay? We just don't use it very much. So what I want to do in order to get you to 
remember what the word means, is I, I want to switch to a different Bible translation, okay? I want to switch to my trusty NIV. Now, this is the Bible that I grew up with, not literally this one, but this translation. The New International Version was translated, I think it was in 1984. This is the version that my mom bought me when she bought me my first kid's adventure Bible. This is the, Bi this is the Bible translation that my youth pastor taught from when, when I was in youth group. This is, I believe it was actually this edition of the NIV that was given to us as kids when we went through our youth group discipleship class. So this is what I was familiar with. And so I, I, I want to go back and read to you um, this translation that is older than the one that I use here. But, but in this particular case, I think it's clearer, okay? It's a little bit older. And in fact, my kids tease me about this. Sometimes whenever I talk to my kids and I go, okay, well, when I was a kid, this is how we did it. And my kids will be like, dad, that was back in the 1900s. <laughs> Like every time I'm like, well, I was, it was different when I was a kid. And I was like, yeah, we don't, nobody does anything like that anymore. That was way back in the 1900s. So this is what I want to do. I want to read to you from my Bible back from the 1900s. Okay, Romans chapter 3, verse 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I think that's word for word the same. And are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. That's pretty much the same. Now look at it. God presented him as a... Now we don't have the word propitiation. What do we have? As a sacrifice of atonement. And that's our point here, right? That's what we're talking about. Jesus is our sacrifice. As a sacrifice of atonement. So... Apparently, this word in the Greek that then gets translated into English is a difficult word to translate. And so in the HCSB, they go with the word propitiation, which, is, I mean, it, it, it is, it's the right word. It's what the word means. Nobody, just, nobody knows what that word means. But propitiation is the word they use. And then in the margins, they put alternate translations. It says, or you could translate it, a propitiatory sacrifice. But if you don't know what propitiation means, you don't know what propitiatory means. Um, or an offering of an atonement, or as a mercy seat. And then in the NIV, it says um, a sacrifice of atonement. And then in the, um, in the margins, it says, or you could translate it this way, as the one who would turn aside wrath, taking away sin, which is what propitiation means. So let's stay in NIV for now. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood, he did this, look at this, to demonstrate his justice because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. What are the sins that were committed beforehand? I assume this would be the sins that were committed before Jesus died on the cross. There were humans that lived for thousands of years before Jesus died on the cross. Some of those people trusted in God. Some of those people were forgiven of their sins, but they were forgiven of sins without those sins being paid for by Jesus yet. So there's this period of time before Jesus came where there's these sins that were overlooked, right? They had been left unpunished. But we've already talked about the fact that if God is just, he can't just leave it that way. Apparently there was a temporary period of time where he could say, this is going to be paid for. But he could, not just he could not just leave sin unpunished indefinitely. So in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. Look at verse 26. He did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time, so as to be, now I want you to notice it's two things, so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. So as to be just and the one who justifies, so as to be simultaneously fair and forgiving toward those who have faith in Jesus. God couldn't just leave sin unpunished. He could just make us pay, but there's no mercy in that. So he chose, I will pay. I will pay for them. That's how he was just and forgiving simultaneously. Jesus Christ is our sacrifice. Praise be to God for his indescribable gift. Amen. Let's pray. God, we thank you for demonstrating your justice and your desire to justify, to make righteous people who are not righteous. We thank you for, for being just and saying sin must be paid for, and then instead of saying, so you all sinners pay for it, that you would make a way through Jesus Christ's sacrifice, that you would say, I'll pay. That's incredible. That's something that maybe some of us who have been Christians for a long time take for granted, and we need to remember. And then maybe there are some of us here who are kind of new to Christianity, and we go, whoa, this is so incredible. Who knew God was like this? And so we thank you. We thank you for who you are. And we look forward to, in just the next few minutes, to celebrate the Lord's Supper, 
a ceremony that's really all about this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.